The last part of our script that we haven't yet discussed are methods. In our script, we already had the start and update method predefined when we have created our weapon script. Let's take a look at the update method. It has a void and update, so the name and the parentheses, and then it, there is this uh, code block of the method. So we put the code that should run when we want to call this method inside its code block. Now, in general, methods represents behaviors that our object can perform. So the movement of enemies in a game is a behavior that is defined as a separate method move enemy and is called in our update method of the enemy script that we will create soon. Now in our game each enemy will have the enemy script on it and that is how they are moving. Now back in Visual Studio the update method is defined by its name so update and those parentheses in between which we can pass some data to a method if we need to. That is why if we want to call our update method, so update, inside our start, we need to add those parentheses so that the compiler knows that we are not passing any data. Because if it takes some data, we can pass it here. Okay, but there is something else here. We also have this void keyword in front of our update method definition. Void is another keyword in c -sharp and it means that the method doesn't return a value. So update method runs and doesn't return anything to the code that calls it. Let's consider again our rotation amount. It performs this calculation and it returns it and saves it in the float rotation amount variable. Let's create a method that will return this result instead. So we are going to go down to the end of the update method and press enter to create some space. We are going to type private and to define a return value for our uh, method we are going to type float because that's what is returned here by this calculation. Let's call this method calculate with capital C, uh, with capital R rotation and with capital A amount. And we are going to add parentheses because we need to do that but I'm going to just close them we are not going to pass any data. And we need to add our code block so we need to add the curly brackets and this is it this is our new method but it is underlined red and if we hover over it we are going to see not all code path returns a value because we have defined here that we want to return a float value so let's add here a new keyword called return and let's type zero as a value to return so what is this return keyword well to illustrate it let's go to our start method and let's call here update so we are invoking the method update here so when our start method runs, it will call our update method and this method in turn will gain control and start invoking its code. So this line and then this line and then what? Well, basically we are going to return. Now here we are returning a void, so nothing. So we do not have to type it, but we can leave it as well. And we are going to return the control to our start method again. So if we write here float a equals calculate rotation amount we're going to now start invoking this line of code so this will assign to a the result of our calculate rotation amount so we are going to call this method now and this will return the value of zero now this will be treated as a float because we have defined here that the return type is of type float so we could very well write zero f but again, we do not have it because the compiler is smart enough to convert it to our float value. And we are going to again return the control to our start method, assign the float A to be zero. And now what happens? Well, we're going to return. So the big idea here is that if we want to return control to the method that called our method, we use return. If we want to return value, we specify the type and we return the value using the return keyword as well. So we can pass data from our method to some other code that calls our method. Let me delete this code from our start method. So what is the point of calling this calculate rotation amount if it returns zero? Well, the point is that if we want to save our code for calculating the rotation amount, we can select it from our update, use Ctrl X to cut it, and in the return we can, instead of returning zero, we can Ctrl V to paste our rotation speed times time dot delta time. The rotation speed is accessible because it is a global variable of our class weapon, so our scope of the calculate rotation amount can access it. But now we need to go back to our update 
and we are going to assign to our float rotation amount the result of our calculate. And I'm going to use auto completion pressing enter and add parentheses. And this is now going to call our calculate rotation amount. And this will return as the result here. And again, when we read our update method, it is much clearer what is going on here. Rotation amount is calculated by this calculate rotation amount. And then it is used to uh, in this line of code. And if we are interested in analyzing how the rotation amount is calculated, we can go to this method and we are not distracted by this transform.rotate around code because it is not necessary to understand this calculation. Okay, so we know how to return value from our method. How do we now pass data to our method? Well, let's go back to our calculate rotation amount method and to specify that it wants to take some data, we are going to put it in this in between those parentheses. We are going to type just as we have defined our data above, we are going to type float. So the type of the data that we want to take and we are going to type the name, so delta. And we are going to now go to the code return rotation speed times we have used time.delta time, but instead we are going to just uh, call here the delta. Okay. And now if we go to our update method, we have this red, red squiggly line because now there is no argument given that corresponds to the required parameter delta of our weapon call. So we are going to go here and we are going to type time.delta time. And this is how we can pass the data to our method. And this is how the method can take the data and use it in its own calculations. And formally, we would tell that the calculate rotation amount takes one argument of type float. Now, this example isn't that refined because there is no point passing the delta time to our method since it can already access it. But I just needed an example to show you how we can use methods, how we can create them and what are the properties of those. Now, if we go back to our script and use Ctrl S to save it and go back to Unity, you may see this uh, green progression bar uh, showing us that something is done in the background. This is Unity processing your code. Now, C Sharp is compiled language, so we write our code in a human understandable way, but then Unity or compiler needs to uh, convert it to a computer understandable code so that it can be used to run in our game. Also, every time you make a change to your script, it will need to be recompiled. So usually we need to stop our game, make a change to our script and restart our game to test if it is all working. Now for beginners, basic takeaway is that compilation means that if we have an error in our code, like a missing semicolon, if we save our script and go back to Unity, you will see in the console that there is an error. And if we try playing our game, we are not going to be able to do that because we have a compilation error and until we fix it, we cannot run our game. Okay, let me fix the error. But now, how is Unity able to run this code in our update method? What is calling our update method? Well, I have already discussed with you the concept of inheritance, that the weapon inherits from mono behavior. You can type mono behavior in Google search engine and the first result should be the documentation of mono behavior. Here, if I slide it down, you will see that it has those methods start and update which we already have in our script. If we slide a bit further, we are going to find eventually that it has the transform component which we have accessed to make our object rotate around our uh, green circle. So the best way to understand it is that the colon mono behavior means that our weapon is a mono behavior. Unity finds all mono behavior scripts and calls on them start, update and other methods that are related to the mono behavior. And just as I have shown you with the update, so calling update in our start method basically means under the hood that our compiler will copy the code from the update and paste it into the start method. So Similarly, you could understand that if we go to mono behavior, right click on this and go to definition, it has some code defined by Unity. If we copy all this code, our methods inherits all the data and methods from the mono behavior class. So while it isn't strictly correct, this way you can understand inheritance. We are getting access to methods and data of mono behavior. And since Unity knows what is mono behavior and it can call methods from it, so update, start and others, now it can also call those methods on our weapon object. Again, that's not strictly what happens, but this is how you can understand inheritance in Unity. Now, again, we have access to this mono behavior because we have this using statement at the top. If I remove it, now we have this red squiggly line 
telling us that this step is unknown by our script. That's why we need this using Unity Engine so that we can gain access to the model behavior. Also, if you would create a new script in Unity, so right click create a C-sharp script, just leave the default name and open it up. If we now go here and delete the model behavior inheritance from the top and save our script, so now it calls public class new behavior script, despite it having start and update methods, if you now go back to Unity and try dragging our new behavior script onto our weapon, we're going to see a warning can't add script. So basically we can't really add it because it is not a mono behavior. Now going further with this idea, the order of execution in Unity is something that Unity does. It gets all the mono behaviors attached to some game object and calls on them awake, then start, and then loops in the physics loop calling the fixed update and then loops in the game loop calling the update method constantly every frame. And since it calls it on all the objects in Unity that are attached to some object in your game, in your scene, that is why our code is constantly invoked rotating our square. That was a lot. And there is even more. We haven't touched on casting, on reference and value types. We didn't discuss arrays, so collections of variables, nor the control flow, so if statements, for loops, but all of this I think is much better explained when we start creating our 2D game, so that's what we are going to do next. See you in the next video where we are going to start creating our 2D game.